Have you ever heard of multi-level marketing? That's when things work in steps and stages. You have a lower level and their sales generate up to the next level and then those sales generate up to the next level and you get more income based on the people you can bring in in a level below you. Well, Marcus Rogers kind of has a multi-level gospel marketing strategy. He doesn't rely on faith alone. See, he relies on steps. Let's listen to Marcus Rogers. Uh, What must I do to be saved? The multi-level gospel marketing that is a non-gospel of Marcus Rogers. What's going on, my brothers and sisters? I'm going to wait for a few of you to log on uh, to this live. You know, just in prayer time today, I felt led to do this video. Now, I want to say this at the very beginning. You know, just pray about everything. Study for yourself. Seek God for yourself. I always encourage people, you know, don't take my word for it. Study the Bible for yourself. Pray about it again and again. You know, seek God and the Holy Spirit. If you don't want people to take your word for it, why have you said the same thing two or three hundred times? It seems like you want people to take your word for it. Otherwise, you just say it, set it, and forget it. But you can't. Spirit will lead you and guide you into all truth. I'm the kind of person that, you know, I like to have a Bible to back up everything that I do. Yeah, unfortunately, out of context, not the holistic word, not a balanced word, not the whole word of God, not rightly dividing the word of truth, just eisegetically using scriptures to back up Marcus Rogers' multi-level gospel. I take the Bible literally, like from front to back. I believe that there was a snake talking to Eve. I believe that Peter walked on water. You know, I believe that the three Hebrew boys survived being thrown in the fire. At the end of this, I'll see if he believes what thus saith the Lord says from Scripture. I believe everything in the Bible from front to back. All right, there's no part of the Bible where I look and I'm like, you know, I believe Noah's Ark and the flood and all the animals. I take it literally. So I'm the kind of person that. I like to have Bible for everything that I do. Now, a lot of people, they might not agree with some things that I say or do, and that's fine. You know, the apostles didn't agree on everything. But one thing they cannot say about me is I have Bible for everything. Everything you see me. Bible taken out of context to, you know, support Marcus Rogers' unbalanced viewpoint of Scripture and unbiblical viewpoint of Scripture. Do I got Bible for it. Now, some people might not like it, but when they actually sit down and talk to me, uh, you know, People, you know, they're like, man, you do have Bible verses for everything that you do. Now, uh, with this particular topic, all right, I want you to understand, I'm not saying, oh, somebody's going to hell or anything like that. But one thing I've noticed about this discussion is that I talk to a lot of religious folks when I've had these kind of debates and where you... Where See, that's, that's Marcus Rogers out. If you don't agree with me, you're a religious person or you're a Pharisee or you're a gummy bear Christian and he cannot accept instruction. He can't accept correction, which has me knowing... You definitely ain't an apostle or a prophet because you will not be corrected. You have no humility. Where it gets kind of funny is people usually take one verse, all right, and they make a whole doctrine off of that one verse. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that's what he's going to do. He's about ready to take a few cherry picked scriptures and make a, make a doctrine, make Marcus Rogers' doctrine from his cherry picked scriptures you have to understand the bible cannot contradict itself so if there's a contradiction all right it's your interpretation and then the other thing is it's your interpretation marcus because it's not contradicting itself you are contradicting it that a lot of people you know when i have this conversation with them they usually do one or two things the bible verses i use they either try to ignore them or i've even had people say well technically that doesn't belong in the bible right so that's a big warning sign when people start trying to add our takeaway so when you see when i he made this right after, not long after I refuted this teaching. So, thanks, Marcus. I, I have a little bitty channel. You feel threatened over the smallest little people, honestly. But you didn't listen to the teaching that I gave on w what you're about to refute again, and you couldn't learn. You can't learn. I break this down. All right, it's going to flow, and it's these verses that are not going to contradict um themselves all right but you're going to leave out the verses that contradict your very multi-level marketing way of presenting the gospel that's not a gospel so that's just the bottom line but like i said pray about it all right so if you're going to take notes john 3 5 mark 16 17 acts 238 acts 19 4 through 6 acts 10 45 through 48 all right when we go through these verses you're going to see five the same verses pattern. 
for every unbeliever over and over again. You're going to see what Jesus said matches what Peter preached, matches what Paul preached, and the pattern just keeps getting followed over and over again, right? So what must I do to be saved? John 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, very I, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus verily uh, answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Listen to me. Except a man be born of the water and of the spirit. It says be born of, the wa of water and of the spirit. And most people believe that when it says of water, it means your natural first birth. Being born of the Spirit is your second birth. Okay, so he's trying to convolute the two and saying to be born again, you must be baptized and be born of the Spirit. That's not what most how most people read that. He cannot enter to the kingdom of God. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus said. He cannot, if he is not born again, if he's not born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Unless a man be born of water and of the spirit. That's how it's written. Okay. He's trying to twist it. God, I want to say it again and again. So you get it stuck in your head. This is what Jesus said. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay. So he's talking about being born of water, natural birth. And that which is born of spirit, spiritual birth. It's not a connection of you, the water makes you born again. And the spirit makes you born again. No, it's the spirit makes you born again. He's trying to convolute baptism in with spiritual rebirth. Um, and so that's Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night. And we can go down a little bit uh, where it says, As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, there he just said it. Whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have eternal life. There's nothing mentioned about baptism. And those are the words of Christ. Okay, the words of Christ say, he who believeth in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I wanted to read that part. Of okay, so he read it no numerous times that it says, he who believes would not perish, but have eternal life. Not say anything about baptism. Okay. For a reason, we're going to bring it all together in the end. Acts 2. But Peter said unto the uh, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. So you're going to contradict Scripture. And said unto him, Ye men of Judea and all of ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to thy words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it it is, but it's the third hour of the day. But this is which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So he says, hey, we're all, you see all these people speaking in tongues? This is what Joel prophesied way back in Joel chapter 2, that I, God, will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. All right? And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in your beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Watch how all of this ties together. Let's skip down to verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Leave it there. Leave it there. That's what's required to be saved. That's what's required to have eternal life. That's what the thief did on the cross. And Marcus uses some kind of a, well, that was when um, the thief who died on the cross was under the old covenant negative the thief who was on the cross who died and confessed christ believed in christ he believed and he was saved shall be saved okay um i'm, I'm gonna i'm just gonna keep reading then peter said unto them this is verse 38 repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins for the remission now anytime i repeat something in the video i want you to write it down uh take a mental note of it okay so in order to to get to this repent be baptized for the remission of sins and he's throwing away all of the scriptures that he's already said that if a man believes he would not perish but have eternal life. Because Peter added in this particular case, be baptized. Yes, you're to be baptized. It's not a it's not a, a suggestion. It's, it's a commandment. But it's not the commandment that makes people have eternal life or to be saved. It's an act of obedience. 
He said, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So baptism is for the remission of sins. For the promise is unto you and your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words that he testified and exhorted, saying, save yourself from this untoward generation. Save yourself. Then they that gladly received this word were baptized, and that day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You hear that? So after they went through this, the, uh, to the church was added 3,000 souls. We're almost done reading the Bible, then I'm going to break it down. Acts 19, and it came to pass that when Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, they were disciples, they were believers already, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? They said unto him, We know, have not heard so much whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said unto them, What then were ye baptized? They said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about 12. All right, one more. Acts 10, Peter opened his mouth and said, uh, I perceive that God is no respect of person, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. The word I say ye know, which was published through all Judea and beginning from Galilee after the baptism which John preach, all right? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing uh, all that were pressed of the devil, right? And so let's see, uh, Peter's preaching to them. We go down to verse 44. When Peter spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them, which heard the word, and they of the circumcision, which believed, were astonished, and many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also, Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard him speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Here we go. We read all those. So they received the Holy Ghost. They weren't saved when they received the Holy Ghost. They had to be baptized to be saved. No, they were baptized in obedience. They were baptized as an ordinance of obedience, just like Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. But it wasn't an act of salvation. Verses, and I didn't want to really stop. I wanted to just read it through and then break it down. In the very beginning, we read what uh, when Nicodemus was talking to Jesus. And the bottom line is Jesus says, you cannot enter the kingdom if you are not born of the water and of the spirit. So Acts 2, the very first message that Peter ever preaches, right? After they come out the upper room, he doesn't come out and say, hey, you guys got to sacrifice animals. Hey, you got to keep the old covenant. He says, listen. Repent, be baptized, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Look at the element that is in there. Repent. Well, you're not going to repent if you're not confessing that he's Lord because you don't feel the need to repent, right? So repenting is acknowledging, confessing that Jesus is Lord. Step then he one. says to be baptized, and Step then he two. says you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Step three. This is the same thing that we see in John 3 where it says, you know what? If you call on the name, the name of the Lord, you're going to be saved, born of the water and of the Spirit. You see that same element here. They get baptized in water, and then they are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Baptized in water, baptized in the Spirit. Born of the water, born of the Spirit, okay? And he says, this is the promise that is unto you and all your children. It's for everybody. Go to Acts 19. We see the same elements of John 3 of which Jesus spoke. If you are not born of the water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom. Paul says, hey. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? It's good that you believe. If you confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. It doesn't say you are saved. You shall be saved, right? So confessing with your mouth is the first step. This is word salad. He's just throwing things out there, throwing things around there to add confusion. When he said you shall be saved, it meant you're saved. When you confess with your, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You're saved, okay? You should still be baptized. It is an act of obedience. It's an ordinance. It's like, hey, I'm drowning. Help me. They're going to throw you a rope and you got to grab it. Or even if they jump in and pull you out of the water, they're going to say, hey, don't shake, don't move, don't kick. So confessing is the first step. And hold on. You know, people want to start arguing. I'm going to break it down with Bible. I just want to show you the same pattern. The same element is all throughout uh, the New Testament. And so uh, he said he says, have they received the Holy Ghost since they believe? And um, he preaches to them. He baptizes them in water and they all speak with tongues in Acts 19. So uh, 
Then said Paul, John, very the baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Everybody in the room, same thing in Acts 10, same thing in Acts 19, the same pattern, same thing in Acts 2, the upper room. Two, two. All right? Then uh, Peter, the same thing with the Gentiles, the same pattern, except they got filled with the Holy Ghost first, then he baptized them, born of the water, born of the Spirit. So he's used three biblical text out of the 30 what is it 39 books of the new testament and makes them prescriptive you don't see it in first or second corinthians you don't see it in first or second thessalonians you don't hear about it in ephesians you don't hear about it in philippians you just don't hear about it you know and it's not that this didn't happen and it's not that anyone has ever said that people should not be baptized he's making it an abject element of salvation okay between the time i believed and the time i was baptized was weeks okay does that mean i wasn't saved until i was baptized or does that mean that the holy spirit hadn't uh, filled drawn me filled me and saved me okay no it doesn't mean that and he's he's not presenting this properly now some people say, well, you're talking about works-based salvation. And this is what I'm talking about, where people will take one verse, they'll misinterpret it, they'll create a whole doctrine. Then when you I hope and pray to God that you can see that's what he's doing. He's taking these three verses that are descriptive. He's making them prescriptive. He's making baptism a means of salvation. He's making tongues a means of salvation. Okay? Not an evidence in those particular instances. And again, if it were... Um, prescriptive, why is it not seen or commanded to the Corinthians, to the Thessalonians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians? Why isn't it in Hebrews? Why isn't it written in Romans? Okay, This is the sad state of false prophecy. This is the fad, sad state of a false prophet. Okay, John 6.28 uh, says, they, they then asked, said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent, which is Jesus. So again, here we go back to what Marcus was talking about in, in John 3, um, 3, 3. It says here, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Which is when you're born and, you know, of water. You know, water breaks, you're born a natural birth. Can he enter a second time? Into so he's talking about his mother's womb and be born. And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water, which is the womb, and of the spirit, which is a spiritual rebirth and renewal, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He doesn't mention baptism here. He says, born of water which is the natural first birth, and born of spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which was came from the breaking of water is from the flesh. That which has come from the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say unto you, unless you be born again, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the, does he mention water? No, he mentions spirit, born of the spirit. So when he says water and spirit, he's talking about natural birth, first birth. You have to be have your first birth, but you have to have your second birth or your spiritual birth. So it is it is with everyone born of spirit. He's making a clear distinction between natural birth and spiritual birth. Not like Marcus is teaching it. He's not saying the baptism and the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. And this is, this is true of Marcus. He doesn't understand the things he's talking about. And he says here, um, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. And many, many, many people have tried to testify to Marcus that he's, he's wrong in this. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses was lifted up, <coughs> the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. It does not say whoever believes and is baptized have eternal life. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. 
Now it goes on here to say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. It doesn't mention baptism. But whoever does not believe, doesn't mention, does not get baptized. Whoever does not believe is not condemned, is condemned already, okay? Because of unbelief, because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked thing hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is right comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Okay, another one of Marcus's favorite scriptures to twist here is Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Okay, believes, baptized will be saved. Now watch what it says here. Uh, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Doesn't say, doesn't say anything about baptism. Okay, so the thing that people are saved with are by their faith, by their belief. What must we do to do the works God requires? To believe in the one whom he has sent. At that moment, you are saved. It is the Holy Spirit which causes you to believe. Okay, let's go to our father Abraham, the one who was justified by what? Faith. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. He's going to boast about that before men. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David spoke also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. In this, in this blessing, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness, his belief was counted as righteousness. His faith in God's promise was counted as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? How then was his faith counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. So your faith is not credited to you after you're baptized. It's not, you got a little bit of faith when you believe and then more faith when you're baptized. You're it's credited to you as righteousness before your baptism. Okay? It's not something that you don't do. It's not something that we don't say to do. It's not like some, you know, it's not anything anyone has ever denied. But it's how Marcus is presenting it as a part of the three step plan. Okay? G you know, Abraham is not presented in Romans 4 as a person who followed a step by step sequential plan of salvation. It says, his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Then it goes on to say, was it before or after he had circumcised? So there's no matter of before or after you're baptized, you're saved. You're saved by faith alone when you believe God. It was not after, but it was before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision, or you receive, do the act of baptism as a seal of righteousness, just like a marriage ceremony is a seal of the marriage. You can be married without the ceremony. The ceremony is to have witnesses and to publicly declare, this is my wife, this is my husband. Circumcision as a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was that to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So it's really, if you want to be 
a child of Abraham and a child of the king and have faith according to scripture, or you want to have faith, the faith according to Marcus. So let's go on to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, the grace through faith, um, by grace through faith. And you were dead in the trespasses and uh, trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. And we're talking about faith here. We're talking about faith being credited to us as righteousness just as Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness for by grace you have been saved through faith that's one step you believe and you're saved by grace through faith just like Abraham and this is not your own doing there's nothing you can do to accomplish this other than believe other than believe God and it is credited to you as righteousness but not your own doing it is the gift of God not a result of work so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them amen and that one of those good works is baptism you know it can be done the day you believe it can be done a week later in my case like I said I think it was it was like 30 days after I had believed. You have to set things up. But it didn't make a lesser JV Christian out of me be, and, until after I was baptized. No, I was saved the day I believed. Not of my own works. Didn't bring nothing else to the table but believing God. Amen. All right, y'all. I hope that you believe God. And it's credited towards you as righteousness. And I think, I hope you do all the other works that are part of this life, but that you don't fall for this multi-level marketing gospel technique of Marcus Rogers. We are saved by grace through faith when we believe. Okay, And there's other, there's many things that are part of our faith, but it doesn't work by this three-step, four-step plan. This ain't, this ain't AA. You don't have a 12-step program. Okay, you believe, and all the other things are worked out. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And you have the gift of God when you believe the message of the gospel. Amen. This is Brother Rob Wilson. Share if you care. Drop a comment. Uh, does this clarify things? Am I off base? Uh, you, you go with Marcus on, you know, there's, there's, there's something more than believing God the needs that you need to have faith in God. It just, it does not back, backed up by scripture. Now he's taking things that happen, but he's making those prescriptive. He's picking and choosing a few verses and making those prescriptive. And there is a prescription. Get baptized, repent, be baptized, and for the remissions of sins. But it's not, it doesn't go, it's not one than the other. It's not dependent on the other. It's dependent on faith. It's dependent on believing the gospel. I hope this makes sense. Amen. Peace and love in Jesus' name.